American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about how the example of young men going to Mass brought about Newt Rockne's conversion. There are few names as connected to football success in the glory days of Notre Dame football as Newt Rockne. His success was both as a player and a coach, wasn't it? Yes, it, yes, it was. He actually helped develop the forward pass into a formidable weapon on offense. Rockney was a student at the University of Notre Dame from 1910 to 1914, and he played tight end on the football team. At the time, Notre Dame fighting Irish football was not really anything special. That changed on All Saints Day, November 1st, 1913, when the fighting Irish traveled to West Point for their annual match against Army. Army always won this game and expected to do so again. But Rockney and his friend, Charlie Dores, had another had a, a surprise worked out. During the previous summer, when both worked as lifeguards at Cedar Point near Sandusky, Ohio, they worked hard on perfecting some plays that utilized the forward pass. The forward pass had been allowed in the rules, but it was almost never used, and it was certainly never practiced, so no one on defense really feared it. But Rockney and Dores had practiced it. In that game, they completely surprised the Army, They completed 14 of 17 passes, including one for a touchdown, en route to a 35-13 victory. It was their first ever win over Army. The forward pass in that one day became a thing in football. So he's an innovator and a risk taker. Uh, Was the forward pass the only thing he developed? No. As a coach, he developed offensive techniques and blocking schemes that had never been used before, some of which, like certain types of pre-snap shifts, were so successful that the defenses had no chance and the leagues actually had to change rules to reset the balance. Uh, but he, And he adapted continuously. In his 13-year career as head coach at Notre Dame, he actually compiled an incredible record of 105 wins, 12 losses, and 5 ties, which still stands as the best overall winning percentage in major college football history. And that streak included 5 perfect seasons and 3 national championships, including in 1924 when he had the fabled four horsemen in his backfield. Rockney was a coach for all of these Catholic football players at Notre Dame, but he wasn't Catholic himself. No, he wasn't. He was actually born in Norway in 1888, where his parents had him baptized and raised as Lutheran. He came to America with his parents when he was five, and they settled in Chicago. He learned to play football in the neighborhood before going to Notre Dame when he was 22. Rockney graduated with honors from Notre Dame in 1914 with a degree in chemistry and pharmacology, and he actually considered going to medical school, but he ultimately stayed at Notre Dame to teach chemistry. That same year, 1914, he married Bonnie Skiles, who was Catholic. He also, happily, took on an assistant coaching position with the Notre Dame football team. And it was with the team as a coach that he eventually became Catholic. Yes. He was an assistant for four years, and he became head coach in 1918. When the team would travel to other cities for games, the mostly Catholic players would make a beeline for the nearest church to get to Mass as soon as they got off the bus. He wasn't requiring this of them. They did it on their own. He thought it would look odd if his players were heading to Mass while the coach was heading to the hotel, so he would join them and just sit in the back. So he noticed the faith of his players that they regularly went to Mass as a group when they arrived in a city. Was it just that witness that brought about his conversion? That certainly had an impact, but he tells of one particularly powerful moment. They had traveled to some city on the East Coast for a big, important game. The night before the game, he was having a tough time sleeping, worrying about the game that day. So he got up about 3 in the morning and went down to the lobby where he paced about and talked with the bellboys to get his mind off the game. After a few hours, he noticed a few of his players, dressed well, heading out through the lobby and into the street. Then a few more came down and a few more. He figured that the only place they could be going at that hour was Mass. So he sat in a place where he couldn't be seen to see how many would come down. More came, some by themselves, other in groups. Rockney related what happened next in these words. In a minute or two, the last of the squad hurried out of the elevator and made for the door. I stopped them and asked them if they, too, were going to Mass, and they replied that they were. I decided to go along with them. Although they probably did not realize it, these youngsters were making a powerful impression on me with their piety and devotion, and when I saw all of them walking to the communion rail to receive, and realized the several hours of sleep they had sacrificed in order to do this, I understood for the first time 
what a powerful ally their religion was to those boys in their work on the football field. Then it was that I really began to see the light, to know what was missing in my life, and later on, I had the great pleasure of joining my boys at the communion rail. Rockney came into the church in 1925, joining his wife and four children, as well as his college football players, at the communion rail. And after his success through 1930, the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame were officially on the map. What a tragedy then that his life was cut so short. Indeed. In April of 1931, while flying to Los Angeles to help with the production of the movie The Spirit of Notre Dame, his plane crashed in a storm in Kansas. His body was found, mangled and thrown clear of the wreckage, but clutched in his hand was a rosary. Rockney left behind his wife of 16 years, four children, a sport revolutionized, and a legacy of turning boys into men as he turned Notre Dame football into the stuff of legend. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please be sure to give us a rating and a review. To learn more about today's topic, to find previous episodes, and to send feedback, please visit sqpn.com history. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or follow StarQuest on social media at facebook.com slash starquestmedia or on Twitter at sqpn. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest. So, in today's terms, we might say he's Bill Belichick. Haha. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> totally going in.